I want to say good evening. I want to welcome you to our uh, Thursday evening Bible study. Again, I'm your host, Pastor Darren Tinsley. We have been experiencing over the last few days uh, some technical difficulties, and even tonight, uh, we did not start at the, the time we desired to start due to some more technical things. But we're grateful to God that um, uh, my wife has been able to fix and uh, put all these things together so that we might be able to go uh, live tonight. And so again, I pray and thank you for your patience, those who are still with us and those who are even on the West Coast um, and other places around uh, the world can be able to tune in. Some of us are ahead of us. And so again, I want to apologize for that, but we're grateful that we can go back and we can look at these messages again and again, and we can share them with uh, uh, those who are open for truth and longing for guidance. Again, we are praying that um, all the messages that we have covered thus far, I believe tonight's message should be um, uh, number 25. It would have been 28, but tonight is uh, 25, I believe, 25 or 26. I'm not, not, I believe it's 26. Yes, I believe tonight is the 26th message. Um, we would have been at 29, um, but nonetheless, here we are at 26 again. So by God's grace, we want to be able to go into his word and look at these uh, studies as we've been going through the book of Daniel. <clears throat> with And this is foundation for being able to understand the prophecies that are written for us in the book of Revelation. And so these two books go hand in hand. <clears throat> As we've been studying through, again, I, 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 I don't believe that we can stress it enough, that in looking at the book of Daniel in a systematic format, it gives us a context for where we are and why it is important for us to stand in the position <clears throat> that God is asking his church to stand. When we see these prophecies and as we're looking at them in a very systematic way, not just taking uh, certain portions <clears throat> and, and, and overemphasizing, but as we look at these prophetic points, these prophetic lines that have been given to us throughout the book of Daniel, that brings us all the way down to the coming of Christ. It brings us down to when God's people are going to be delivered. And the book of Daniel opens with God's people going into captivity. The book of Daniel closes with God's people being delivered, not by Cyrus, but by Christ himself. The Bible tells us in the book of Thessalonians 4 and verse 16, For the Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel, with the trump of God, and the dead in Christ shall rise first, and we which are alive and remain shall be caught up together to meet our Lord in the air. Luke says that as we see these signs, look up. For our redemption draweth nigh. Christ says this generation, the generation that sees all of these signs will not pass, <clears throat> will not pass until the Son of Man comes. And so as we are going through the prophecies of Daniel and as we couple with them uh, the, the outline sketch in the book of Matthew 24, Mark 13, Luke 17, Luke 21, and the Revelation. John, in his uh, delineation of events, in the Gospel of John, he does not go through these prophecies that are outlined in Matthew 24, Mark 13, Luke 17, Luke 21. He, God gives him the book of Revelation, and he, again comes and unfolds to us and brings all of these prophecies together. They meet and end 
in the revelation. And so as we look at these, God says, those that see these signs, how do we know that we're seeing these signs? Because we go, we, we, we look, we have a, hmm, what would we say? We have a, uh, a measuring line in the book of Daniel to show us where we are today. And we can be assured that everything that God has said will happen in its order and in its time. And we don't have to guess at anything, brothers and sisters, because of this measuring line from the prophecies of the book of Daniel. So it's very important for us, brothers and sisters, it's imperative that we as a people of God be able, as the watchman is spoken of in the book of Habakkuk, watchman, what of the night? And we can say the night cometh and so does the morning. We want to be able to give a certain sound. The Bible tells us in the book of Ezekiel that when we see the army coming and if we do not blow the trumpet, well, many cannot blow the trumpet because they do not see the signs. They do not understand where we are. And brothers and sisters, as Daniel says, this is not given for any wisdom of us. However, it is for those who not only will give the correct interpretation, but those who will be able to show in the latter time where we are today. So it behooves us to understand these things, not just because of what I say, um, but because you yourself have gone through these prophecies and you have studied them. And as we understand where we are, we don't have to try to reinvent the wheel to gain some excitement. When Daniel studied these prophecies that related to the times and where he was, Daniel, brothers and sisters, was, was, was revived and he went into his closet and began to pray. And God began to give him additional, or I wouldn't say additional, we can say that, but Gabriel was sent to unfold to Daniel the prophecies he had seen and began to take them further. And so this is where we are, brothers and sisters. We need to be revived by these prophecies, not by what we see happening alone in society, not by wars and rumors of wars, not because of what is coming out of legislative halls, not because of what is coming out of parliament, not because of what we see in the street. We have to be revived by what we understand in the word of God. So if nothing was happening in the street, if nothing was happening in parliament, if we did not see anything happening, we would know of a surety it was coming because God's word will not return unto him boys. So we have to be excited and revive based upon the word of God <clears throat> and not um, trying to follow the uncertainty of human politics, brothers and sisters, the uncertainty of human politics, because regardless of what man says, we have been told that God has stationed four angels on the four corners of the earth, holding the ones of the earth. We know that those angels can hold armies because of what Gabriel told us in the book of Daniel chapter 10, that he was going to go and stand with the Prince of Persia. And he says, when I leave, Greece is coming. Not by what men vote in parliament, brothers and sisters, but by the decree of God, when men pass the limits of divine forbearance and they refuse to give heed to the principles of God, the angel of mercy takes their flight and allows things to happen as God designs that they would. But we pray that we would be found in a shelter, not cowering as it were from fear, but standing under the mighty wings of God and inviting all, inviting all to take shelter in Christ. So with that, by God's grace, we want to go into the word of God tonight. So we pray that again, that you have a pencil, uh, paper, something to write with and more 
than anything, we pray that the Holy Spirit would be with you and that angels would draw near to your dwelling. So with that, let us have a word of prayer. We are, <clears throat> again, looking at these particular prophecies in the book of Daniel. We're looking at these particular uh, prophecies here in the book of Daniel. And as we said, and we again, I want to continue to emphasize um, that the prophecies of Daniel gives us a context for where and what we are to do. Turn the, the visor so I can see it. All right. It gives us a context, thank you, of what mm, the position that we ought to be standing in. Without the prophecies of Daniel, we have no context for why we do what we do. We don't understand why um, um, we ought to be standing in the peculiar position that we are to be standing in. We do not understand how God is providentially placing us in places for the purpose of the proclaiming and the preaching of the gospel. Brothers and sisters, if there was ever a time not to trust ourself and our own opinion and even our own wisdom, it is now, even after we study the word of God, even after we see clearly from God's word what it says, there's still a divine dependence that is placed, that is needed uh, uh, in order to fulfill God's word. I was reading this morning uh, in the book of Leviticus, and I was, I was going through those earlier chapters, how Aaron and his sons were being consecrated for holy office, and how Moses was meticulous in explaining the offerings and how they were to be performed, performed, and Moses even demonstrating for Aaron and his sons how these offerings were to be carried out according to the specification that God revealed while he was in the Holy Mount. And even after that explanation, and then Aaron and his sons, Nadab and Abihu, participated in those offerings, participated in seeing the glory of God being manifested as they uh, uh, participated in the services, how God's glory filled the tabernacle, how fire came down from heaven and lit the offering. They saw that. And then the Bible says in the next chapter that Nadab and Abihu put strange fire before the Lord. Strange fire. They were there cooperating with God. And, and then in the very next chapter, they went completely against the known will of God. It's not enough for us, brothers and sisters, to see the instructions. We must pray that our hereditary and our cultivated tendencies to wrongdoing be checked every moment of our lives. Because we cannot assume that just because we have done everything right up until this point that God will overlook a slight slight, ever so slight deviation from the will of God. We must know that sin will not be tolerated, brothers and sisters. And this is something that we have to come to in our own lives. No matter who we see building golden calves, no matter who we see uh, uh, prancing and, and moving before the Lord in their own strength and their own garments of unrighteousness. No matter what we see transpiring around us, we must give an account for what is done in our bodies. We have to trust in God with all of our hearts at every moment, brothers and sisters. So as we see these things transpiring, and we're seeing all these things happening and we're starting to say, you know what? There's some decisions I need to be making. Well, brothers and sisters, we need to bring those decisions, place them on the altar, ask God to give us wisdom and watch God's divine providence because we have no fear for the future except we forget how God has led us in our past. And that is through his word. 
So even when we look at our past, there are many times that God has blessed us in spite of us. Say that one more time. There are many times, if not all, have mercy, that God has blessed us in spite of us. And this is why he gives us his word. His word, he says, Psalms, 10, Psalms 119, thy word, O God, is a lamp unto my feet. It is a light unto my pathway. God's word, the entrance of his word, Psalms 119, 130, giveth light. It giveth understanding to the people. So don't let your past by itself be your criteria for making decisions in the present and in the future. You must make sure what was in the past was in the harmony with God's word and where you see you are out of touch, where you see you are out of joint with Christ and he blessed you in spite of, you must make a decision now based upon what God has shown you in his word. Samson, brothers and sisters, made a fatal decision based upon his past. God has been with me in the past. He allowed me to tear off gates. He allowed me to catch foxes. God allowed me to slay Philistines. God allowed me to kill lions. God allowed me to do all these things, sleep with harlots, violate the covenant. God has allowed me to do all this. Surely God will not uh, uh, hold me uh, accountable for this seemingly in his mind, small sin. And that was the fatal decision of Samson's experience. And these things are there for us, brothers and sisters, for warnings, not just the promises, but the warnings of God are there to serve as a barrier for us. Every promise, every warning means me. And I must embrace these promises and these warnings. Amen. <clears throat> As we're looking at these prophecies of the book of Daniel, I want you to go to your screen. I want you to notice something here. It says, we have no time to lose. Troublous times are before us. The world is stirred with the spirit of war. Soon, soon, watch this. Soon the scenes of trouble spoken of and the prophecies will take place. The prophecies in the 11th, of, the 11th of Daniel has nearly, nearly reached its complete fulfillment. Much of the history that has taken place in fulfillment of this prophecy will be repeated. Now notice what it says. The prophecy in the 11th of Daniel has nearly reached its complete fulfillment. That's what we're studying, right? It says in the 30th verse, remember we talked about the ships of Shittim and we talked about this power that would come up, that little horn power, which was the king of the north, which was the papacy. The 30th verse, a power is spoken of that shall be grieved and return and have indignation against the holy covenant. So shall he do he. He shall even return and have intelligence with them that forsake the Holy Covenant. Similar scenes to those described in these words will take place. We see evidence that Satan is fast obtaining the control of human minds who have not the fear of God before them. Those are that forsake the Holy Covenant. Let all read and understand the prophecies of this book, for we are now entering upon the time of trouble spoken of. Brothers and sisters, one thing that we want to understand is that we are told that those verses that we read in Daniel 11, verse 30, down to verse 36, we've studied those verses and we saw that that power was that antichrist power. It was that substitute power. It was that power that would come against the covenant, the law of God. He would think to change Daniel 7, 25. He would think to change times and laws. He would speak great words 
against the Most High. He would exalt himself, the Bible says in the book of Thessalonians chapter 2, he would magnify himself above everything that is called God. He would sit in the seat of God, showing himself that he is God. This is what this power would do. How was it able to accomplish this? We saw by King Clovis of France. We saw by the, those that did not have the fear of God. They had departed from the truth and they forsook the principles of truth and they formed alliances. They formed an ecumenical alliance with these apostate uh, 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 powers, with these individuals, and as a result of it, it brought them down, and yet it exalted the papacy, the little horn, the king of the north. Now, again, all of this is going to be layered again when we get to the book of Revelation. And so therefore, I try not to go uh, uh, get too much into it because we're going to pass over this ground again when we come to the book of Revelation. It's going to is going to put that nail in a sure place and we're going to find that God is going to pin us, as it were, to the to the straight truth so that we would not deviate to the right hand, to the right hand or to the left, but that we would have set our faces like a flint. Now notice. So in the book of Daniel, chapter 11, let's go there. If you're in your Bibles, let's go to the book of Daniel, chapter 11, Daniel, the 11th chapter, Daniel, chapter 11. And we came to verse 40 and we came to verse 40 and the Bible tells us, and at the time of the end, this power would, there would be a power that would push at the king of the north. And it says in Daniel eleven forty, and at the time of the end, what did we see was the time of the end? It was 1798. Matter of fact, let's again, look at verse 30. Look at verse 35. Yes, look at verse 35, right? Look at what it says in verse 35, again, about the king of the north. And some of them of understanding, those who understand the times, those who understood the word of God, those who did not align themselves with this king of the north, with the papacy, with the little horn, with the antichrist, same power. Different names, same power. Those that did not align themselves with this apostate power, these were the, what we would call today, Protestants. Not evangelicals. Evangelical community are not Protestant. They are not protesting. Yes, they're out in the streets protesting, yes. But in the truest sense of a protest, they are not engaged in it. What we are seeing in the streets is sedition. It's uprisings. It is revolution. This is what we're seeing in the streets. This is, this is a result of, of the teachings that come from that power of the bottomless pit in Revelation chapter 11. Again, we're going to get there. But what happens is those who did not align themselves with this power, they protested against its teachings. They protested against his influence over nations and states and legislative uh, 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 um, laws that brought unnecessary persecution and, um, uh, uh, and death to nations, to people. So those that were not, that understood, that didn't align themselves the Bible says that they would fall. Many of they would be purified as they went through these trials. This is what the Bible is speaking of. It is those that the Bible says in Daniel 7, 25, there were, they would wear out. 
the saints of the Most High. John says this in the book of Revelation, chapter 13. They would make war against the saints and prevail against them. So here the Bible tells us in Daniel, 7, Daniel 11, 35, and some of them of understanding shall fall, not all, but some, to try them and to purge and to make them white. In other words, they would get their white robes in the second coming of Jesus. This is what they would do even, even to the time of the end, because it is yet for an appointed time. Verse 40, and at the time of the end shall the king of the south push at him. Go to chapter 12. Go to chapter 12, brothers and sisters. Again, it gives us a time for the time of the end, the end of time. Notice what it says. In Daniel chapter 12, Daniel chapter 12, look what the Bible says in verse 4. Look what the Bible says in verse 4. It says, but thou, O Daniel, shut up the words and seal the book, even to the time of the end. Remember, purified, made white, they're going to fall. All of this to the time of the end. The king of the south will push at the king of the north at the time of the end. Daniel shut up these words until the time of the end. In. All right. Come on now. Notice what it says. <clears throat> it says, but in the, but, but, it said not but, seal the book even to the time of the end. Many, verse 4, shall run to and fro. Knowledge shall be increased. Knowledge of these prophecies. Understanding of these, this vision that Daniel is having in chapter 11. It is going to crease and light will shine more and more until the perfect day. He says, then I, Daniel, looked and behold, there stood, I'm in verse five, there stood other two, the one on this side of the bank of the river and the other on that side of the bank of the river. And one said to the man that was clothed in linen, we said the man clothed in linen, Excuse me? I'm in chapter 12, yes. We said the man clothed in linen was Jesus. We identified him, and this is Christ standing there between these two angels. Have mercy. David says, Thou that dwellest between the cherubims, shine forth. So God is shining forth his light, his truth. He's going to give understanding to his people at the time of the end. That light from between the two cherubims, the Shekinah glory, God will shine forth to his people. We're seeing Jesus. We're seeing God. Oh, mercy. Come on. We, we, you know, we, we won't go there just yet. Verse 6. One said to the man clothed in linen, which was upon the waters of the river, how long shall it be to the end of these wonders? How long shall be the end of these things? Daniel, is, Daniel was told to shut up the books, but the angel says, how long? Why would an angel be concerned about prophecy? The Bible says in 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 12, that these are things that angels desire to look into. They desire to study the word of God. So how about it, brothers and sisters, that that angel that God has sent to stand with us, that angel that is there with us, how about we open the word of God and when there's no one to study with, how about we study with our angel? But why? Because he desires to study these things. Notice what it says. So just know when you're at home and you're opening your Bible and you're sitting there and everyone is asleep and you open the word of God and you're asking God for understanding, you can just say, oh, you just, you know, like when you're holding your book, just kind of hold it over a little bit so the angel could see it. Amen. Just know that his presence is there and he wants to study the word of God. The Bible says, 
And I heard, and I heard the man clothed in linen, which was upon the waters of the river, when he held up his right hand and his left hand unto heaven, and swear by him that liveth forever and ever, uh, uh, that, that, that it shall be for a time, times, and a half. Wait a minute. He asks, when shall these things be? How long, he says, for a time, times, and a half. And when he shall accomplish to scatter the power of the holy people, all these things shall be finished. And then the Bible says, verse 8 and 9, And I heard, but I understood not. And he said, O oh my Lord, what shall be the what? End of these things. Daniel was told to shut up the words. The angel says, well, how long shall be to the end of these wonders? For a time, times, and a half. Well, we saw that that time, times, and a half is a 1260, 538, 1798. But then so now Daniel says, well, you told me to shut it up. The angel says, how long? You said a time, time. Daniel said, I don't get it. So he just says plainly himself, Lord, when shall be the end of these wonders? Look what he says. And he said, go thy way, Daniel, for thy words are closed and sealed till the time of the end. So that when the king of the north goes down, God's word comes open. God's word opens. Remember, we use the analogy of Jezebel and Elijah. Elijah walks in. Elijah says, it will not rain, but according to my word. Not his word, but God's word. But he had accepted as his own. He went into hiding. James tells us, James chapter 5, I believe, verse 17. James tells us he went into hiding for three years and a half. There was no open vision. There was no open proclaiming or prophecies of the word of God. The prophets were put to death. Those who did not want to eat from Jezebel's table. Those who refused, brothers and sisters, to bow down to Jezebel. Those who refused to forsake the principles of God. They were put to death. And those that wasn't, they were hid in caves. God nourished them, as it were, in the wilderness. Elijah in the wilderness was being nourished, but Elijah was sent to Zarephath. Elijah was sent to preach to the widow woman and her son. Not in the open air, he went in her house. So while this power was in operation, God's servants was doing house to house ministry. Couldn't preach in the open air. COVID-19 had the social distance. So what were they doing? Come on, brothers and sisters. He was preaching in the house. God is showing us, brothers and sisters, if we will understand, God is showing us how he would have his people to be working in these last days. Remember, we said it's not just the prophecies. It is the manner and principles how God would have his people to work. Daniel shows us an example. Elijah shows us an example. Parallel, uh, 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 parallel prophets and parallel instruments for God's people to follow in the last days. So now, so while, but then after three and a half years, what happens? God tells Elijah, go stand on Mount Carmel. After three and a half years, Daniel, I'm going to open your book. Watch this. So the Bible shows us here that Daniel's book was to be closed for a time, times, and a half. But at the time of the end, time, time, and a half of times, I'm going to open after 1260, when the king of the north, when the little horn, when Jezebel. When Antichrist, same thing. When they are brought down, God will open the door for his people.
to preach. This is why it's important for us to understand the movements of God. Why? It de- it, I don't want to use it doesn't matter. I'll say this. <clears throat> when the king of the south would bring down the king of the north, God's people were to take the opportunity to preach, not to be focusing and chasing the king of the south, not to be running around seeing what she's doing. The door is open. Do what God has told you to do. I've opened the door. Go and preach. But what had happened? What had happened to Elijah? Elijah was sent to preach, but he started listening to Jezebel. Jezebel said, I'm going to I'm going to persecute you. And Elijah took off and ran, ran to the woods, ran hiding because Elijah wasn't listening to God. At that point, he was listening to Jezebel. He was seeing what she was doing. He was understanding what she was saying. He was watching CNN. He was watching MSN and RT and Fox. And, and, and he was seeing what was happening uh, 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 in the world rather than doing what God had called him to do. And God had called him, brothers and sisters, and had put him in a position where he could begin to see the fruit from the outpouring of the Spirit of God. The problem with the church, why we have become so paralyzed is because we're listening for Jezebel and we're running to the woods and we're trying to get away from Jezebel rather than doing what God is asking us to do. So we have to position ourselves, brothers and sisters, in the place where God wants. Study the life of Jesus and you will find there are very few occasions in which God paid any attention to what Tiberius Caesar was doing at that time. Any attention to what Pilate was doing, what Herod was doing. Jesus was concerning himself with those who were captives. Jesus was concerned himself with the publicans and the harlots. Jesus was concerning himself with those brothers and sisters who had been chained like, like captives to the car of Satan. Jesus was concerned with the work that he had come to do. We are too concerned with what powers are doing and not with what the power of God is trying to do. So we have to understand as we see these things, Lord, where I need to get in, where I fit in, where do you want me to be? What should I be doing? I know what they're doing, but right now, like Pharaoh, chasing the 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 armies of God uh, chasing the children of Israel they're wandering in darkness God says there's a there's a pathway move forward in faith but we want to stand and see how did God make darkness come between us and Pharaoh I can hear their chariots and we're just standing there listening and watching and waiting for the chariots to come and then when they come we think we're going to get across doesn't work like that While God is dealing with them, God is saying, move, but we're not moving, brothers and sisters. We're not moving. We're not praying. We're not saying, Lord, what should I, should I do? We're constantly trying to see what is Trump going to say tomorrow? What is, where's the Pope going so we can get our tickets and get there to be there when the Pope comes? We're following him around. We're trying to see what they're doing rather than saying, Lord, okay, what about these people around me? What about these people here that need the truth? Yes, the Pope hasn't come to Los Angeles, but the people here need the gospel. No, the Pope hasn't come to to Michigan and no, the Pope hasn't come to to Boston and no, the, the, the Pope hasn't come to Trinidad and no, the Pope isn't here and the Pope isn't in Canada, but still the people need to hear the gospel. But we're spending all of our efforts, brothers and sisters, following Jezebel. That's what God gave. Have mercy. Go anoint. uh, God told Elijah. He said, go anoint Hazel and Jehu. Let them deal with Jezebel. You go anoint Elisha. And Elisha is going to build the schools of the prophets so that God's people can be brought back to the truth. You go and build the truth. You go and build the kingdom of God and you let Jehu and Haziel fight with Jezebel. You go do what I told you to do. And this is what we have to understand our place. So praise God. He's going to anoint the the Haziels. God is going to anoint the Jehus. But brothers and sisters, he's also anointing Elisha's. Those who are doing the work that God would have them 
to do. Because remember, when the rain came, what was, have mercy, what was uh, uh, Elisha doing when they had found when when Elijah found him, he was plowing. Oh, brothers and sisters, you better believe he wasn't plowing those three and a half years. There was nothing to plow. There was no rain, but the rain had come. Elijah had been forty days, and brothers and sisters, so now the rain had come and watered the seed. And what was Elijah doing? Elisha doing? He was plowing. He was working the fields, and this is where God wants to find us. Not worrying about Jezebel. God has the Jehus and the Haziels for that. God is calling us to build. God is calling to educate his people. Why? Because the, the, the sound of the trumpet is sounding and is waxing louder and louder. Notice. Notice what our Bible says. Let's go in our Bible to the book of Revelation. Revelation. Go to Revelation chapter 10. This is important because remember, you just read, you just read in Daniel, the 12th chapter, how there was, you're going to Revelation 10, but in Daniel chapter 12, the man clothed in linen that stood between the two chair angels, mercy, how he raised his hands to heaven and he swear and he said, uh, 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 that the book would be closed on for the time, the time and the dividing of time or to the time of the end. He lifted up his hands and he swore to heaven and he said, the book is closed. The book is closed. But then we come over to Revelation chapter 10 and we see a similar scene, but with a different outcome. Notice what your Bible tells you in the book of Revelation chapter 10. Revelation chapter 10 and look at verse 1. Revelation chapter 10 and look at verse one, brothers and sisters, because this is pivotal for us to understand as we look at the king of the north when he comes back. Because as he's coming back, we're not just to stand there idly and watch him come. We're not just to sit there and say, wow, the king of the north is coming back. The king of the north is coming back. No, brothers and sisters. Yes, we ought to give the trumpet a certain sound. We ought to be saying, get ready. Get ready, brothers and sisters. Do you now reflect the lovely of Jesus, the lovely image of Jesus as you should? Are you ready for what is about to break upon the world as an overwhelming surprise? Surprise to who? Surprise to those who are not watching. Surprise to those who are dreaming about their future. Surprise to those who are watching and waiting for the economy to come back. Even a surprise to those who are sitting and just waiting for trouble. Just waiting for the big one to come. Just waiting for something to happen. And they had, I'm not even going to go there, but notice, but in Revelation chapter 10, so as the king of the north is coming back, God wants us to be active. Notice what it says in Revelation 10. Bible says, and I saw another mighty angel come down from heaven, clothed with the cloud. A rainbow was upon his head and his face were as it were, and his face was as it were the sun. You could read in Revelation chapter one, who is this? And his feet as the pillars of fire, as they had been burned in an oven. You can see this in, in the book of Daniel. You can see this in the book of Ezekiel chapter 10, chapter 1. You can see this in Revelation chapter 1. This, brothers and sisters, is none other than the personage of Jesus. Why is he depicted as an angel? Because angels are messengers. Jesus comes with a message. I wonder what message he's coming with. I wonder what message he has. Notice, he says, verse two, and he had in his right hand, have mercy, a little book was open, not closed, it was open. And he said, his right foot upon the sea and his left foot upon the earth. And he cried with a loud voice as when a lion roareth. And when he had cried, seven thunders uttered their voices. And when the seven thunders had uttered their voices, I was about to write and I heard the voice of heaven and I heard the voice from heaven saying unto me, seal up those things which the seven thunders uttered and write them not. And the angel which I had and the angel which I saw stand upon the sea and upon the earth. He lifted up his hand to heaven and he swear by him that liveth forever and ever 
who created the heaven and the things that therein are, and the earth and the things that therein are, and the sea and the things which are there that which are therein, that there should be what? Time no longer. In other words, the end of time. Time no longer. Time of the end. Remember Daniel 10, Daniel 12, he raises up his hands and he says, I'm sealing the book until the time of the end. Now he's seen in Revelation chapter 10, not with the book sealed, but with the book open. And he says, time no longer, time of the end. He's talking about the book of Daniel. He's talking about those prophecies that Daniel did not understand. God sends not Gabriel, but Jesus comes to open the book and to give it to us. He's given to us an open book. He's shining forth. Jesus is given this truth to us, brothers and sisters. His angels have come to signify what has been declared in heaven. And so here in the book of Revelation, John gets the book of Daniel. He doesn't get it sealed. He gets it open. And God tells, Dan, tells John, he says, John, take the book, eat it up. Eat this book. David says, thy words were found and I did eat them. No, 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 not, Je not David, Jeremiah. Jeremiah says this in Jeremiah 16. Go there with me. Go to Jeremiah. I believe it's chapter 16. Don't quote me on that just yet. But I believe it's Jeremiah 16 or Jeremiah 15. One of the two. It's Jeremiah chapter uh, 15, Jeremiah chapter 15 and verse 16. Jeremiah 15, verse 16, look at what it says. God tells John in that book, which is a symbol of you and me in these last days, eat the little book. Now, I'm not going so much into Revelation 10 because that's not the point of our study tonight. Just Again, helping us to understand that since the time of the end, this book has been opened and God expects the church to be eating from this book. And as we eat this book and as we assimilate this book, Christ says, except you eat the flesh of the son of man and drink his blood, you have no life in you. He said the words, watch this, that I speak unto you, John 6, 63, the words that I speak unto you, they are spirit and they are life. These prophecies in the book of Revelation is spirit and life for the church. If we understood where we were, there would be seen more life among the people of God. But because we have forsaken the word of God, we have forsaken the prophecies of the last days. And we now as a church, as the membership feel that God's word and his truth and his cause is irrelevant. And this is why many are taking to these seditions to find some relevancy for living because they do not feel relevant in a backslidden church. And we're trying, no, 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 don't do this, don't do that. But brothers and sisters, the church is irrelevant. The church is in a backslidden condition and we won't talk about it. We don't want to talk about it. We just want to chase the Pope around with books. We just want to focus on what they're doing. But oh, brothers and sisters, it is a backslidden church that does not relish the, prince, the truth of God's word. It is a backslidden church that has no relevancy for the word of God. And I'm not just talking about showing up at the 11 o'clock hour either. We have no relevancy to study the word of God. And so we show up on the seventh day at 11 o'clock, just like 7-Eleven. It's just a quick stop. We're not there to fellowship in the word of God. We are there to get our quick fix at our mini mart. And this is what the 11 o'clock hour is become. I'm not just talking about in conference churches, brothers and sisters. I'm talking about in so-called present truth churches. We just show up to get a quick fix and then we're off again to do nothing. 
church and, and again, no relish for the word of God. Doesn't mean we need to stay in church all day. But what we have and what we get, what are we doing with it, brothers and sisters? If we only came to church 10 minutes and we got and, and we were filled with the spirit of God and we were encouraged by his word and we were provoked unto good works. And then we can go forth rejoicing, brothers and sisters, coming back, bringing our sheep with us, testifying what God has been doing. But there are no testimonies because there is no experience. That's why we don't have testimonies because there is no experience, brothers and sisters. So what happens is, so we're not focusing on Dan, uh, Revelation chapter 10 just now, but we just want to show that God in the time of the end, when the king of the north goes down, God is looking for Elijah to come out of her hiding place. Not that she's been hiding because she's afraid she's been working from house to house. She's been sitting in the homes of widows, which the Bible calls pure religion. Matter of fact, look, uh, we're, we're, let's read this in James. Let's look, look at this in James 15, 16. James 15, 16. The Bible says, thy words, thy words were found. Watch this. And I did what? Eat them. And thy word was unto me the joy and the what? Rejoicing of mine heart. For I am called by thy name, O Lord, God of hosts. Verse 17, I sat not. Why? Because thy word in the assembly of the mockers, nor rejoiced. I sat alone because thine hand, because of thine hand. For thou hast filled me with indignations. So here, Jeremiah said, thy words were found. And once he began to search the word of God, he said, wow, I am called by the name of God. I have been called to be peculiar. And because of this, he said, I can't sit in the assembly of those who mock the truth. I can't sit around those who make light of the times in which we live in. I can't sit in those assemblies. If there's no assembly, I will sit at home. If there's no fellowship, oh, you need to find some church. No, you don't, brothers and sisters. You don't need to find no church. And, 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 and the way things are now, you can't find a church. You, we have to, and so in 1798, when the king of the south comes, king of the north goes down, God says, hey, 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 where's Elijah? Where's Elijah? Where's Elijah? Elijah has to come forth so that when the king of the north returns, God's people will have been doing what God would have them to do. I want you to notice this. I want you to notice this, brothers and sisters. Notice what your Bible says. Go with me to James. Go with me to James. And let's stop by James chapter 1. James, hmm. James, here it is, James chapter 1, verse 27. James chapter 1, verse 27, because notice, brothers and sisters, we cannot forsake the, the, the assembling of ourselves. And we talk about assembling, we're not talking about in buildings, because have mercy, they want you to social distance. They don't want you near each other. <clears throat> they want you running from the plague, as it were. But God's people have to understand something, brothers and sisters, that God is giving us that God has called us with a purpose and despite this plague or a future plague, God's work has to be done. What we have failed to do in times of peace, we will now have to do under the most trying circumstances. There is no going backwards, brothers and sisters. The world is not going back to where it is because guess what? It didn't benefit the church when it was back where it was. We were just as lethargic. I didn't say you were. I said we were just as lethargic and lazy as, <clears throat> as, as, as they say, all outdoors. But now God has allowed an agitation to come. There's an agitation in the world. And God is trying to arouse us 
But we can't keep looking at what's happening around us and think that's going to arouse us. That's not going to do it. The Word of God is, has to do it. We have to get back into the Word of God. We have to study. We have to pray. We have to search our hearts. Notice what he says in James chapter 1. James chapter 1, verse 27, the Bible says, verse 27, pure religion, pure religion and undefiled before God and the Father is this, to do what? Visit the fatherless and the widows in their affliction and to do what? Keep yourself, myself, unspotted for the world from the world this is what god this is what god expects of his people to keep ourselves unspotted from the world to visit the fatherless and the widows this is what elijah was doing so what does that say elijah pure religion undefiled religion. This is the word we need to be looking for. Everyone, brothers and sisters, is not afraid. Everybody is not afraid of you getting close to them. But you have to be prayerful now. Ask God for wisdom. We have to be saying, Lord, who, who is open for truth? Who is longing for guidance? It's like walking through the garden and those who have a garden, I believe the lesson will, will come home to the mind. And as you walk up and down the rows, and as you see that fruit developing, there are signs that tells you that the fruit is ripe. There are signs that let you know that it's ready. You might look and may say, I want it now, but it's not ready. It's not ready. So therefore you have to walk and say, Lord, uh, let the meditations of my heart, let the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be acceptable in thy sight, O Lord, thy strength and my redeemer. So as you walk, you're looking for that soul that's open for truth, longing for guidance. As you press, open your mouth. God will fill your mouth with wisdom. If you lack it, ask God to give you wisdom. And God will show you how to fish because like he told the disciples, follow me and I shall make you fishers of men from henceforth. You will not catch fish, but men. He doesn't want us out there throwing bait in the water for fish. No, he wants us to catch them. And the disciples needed a lot of work. They didn't know how to catch fish, brothers and sisters. They didn't know how to catch men, I should say. And from the looks of it, they were not gr that great of fishers either. When you really look at it, they were not that great of fisher. But God says, follow me and I'm going to make you fishers of men. And oh, brothers and sisters, they drove the fish away more so than gathering the souls that Christ was coming, drawing. Because as Christ was drawing them, the disciples were either driving them away or in the case of the demoniacs, they were running away. So they needed that time with Christ. They needed to come into that school with Christ. And as Christ showed them how to work so that as persecution began to heighten, they had an efficiency from the Holy Ghost that did not endow them with abilities that they themselves were not cultivating. Let's make this point. The latter rain does not develop something that has not been implanted by the seed. Rain doesn't develop what's not there. It doesn't. So when the seed is planted, now the rain assists with the soil and it develops what's there. So when, the, so when Christ breathed upon them, he was, simply, he was simply developing what they have ex had accepted of his teachings and his practices. Let's go back in your Bibles to the book of Daniel chapter 11. Daniel chapter 11. Oh, brothers and sisters, again, why are you emphasizing these things, preacher? I thought we were studying the prophecies. Well, we have to understand that we have to be working while we see these prophecies. These prophecies cannot 
paralyze us. They have to inspire us. So we have to see that in these prophecies, has God left his people without instruction? Has God given us light? What is he doing? God is developing. He's waking up his people. Now, what was Elijah doing? Let's put this last point as we move forward. When Elijah stood on Mount Carmel, what was the purpose of Elijah? Did he go on Mount Carmel for his own accord? No, that's not what he did. Elijah wasn't out there for himself. Elijah was out there, according to Malachi, he was to turn the people's hearts back to God. Elijah was to prepare a people to stand in the presence of God to be able to work for humanity. Say that one more time. Elijah was to prepare a people to stand in the presence of God and to work for humanity. Not just, oh, the trying hour, but brothers and sisters, God has raised up Elijah and Elijah has brought a message so that the people can be aroused to cooperate with the message and the work of God in the present time. So it has to be the purpose. How do we know the Elijah message? Because Elijah is not saying, look at me. Elijah is not drawing all the attention to himself. Elijah is not saying that if you're not working with me, then you're no good. Elijah is not building up a moat around him. Elijah is not making people declare their allegiance to him. That's not what Elijah is doing. Elijah's not saying, if you're not working with me, then I'm not working with you. That's not what the spirit of Elijah is doing. Elijah is not saying, well, if you don't see it the way I see it, then guess what? We can't work together because I know, I know, I know that God has showed me. And if you don't see the way I see it, then I know that God didn't show you. That's not what Elijah was doing. That's not what Elijah was. Elijah was saying, hey, I told you that he that cometh what? After me is actually before me. He said, hey, I'm not the bride or the bridegroom. He said, I am a friend. He must increase. I must decrease. That meant that, that the work of Christ increased. That means that the disciples work increased while John the Baptist decreased. There were people John and Andrew, who were disciples of John, and they went and worked with Christ. Therefore, they increased while John decreased. John was not in competition. He was not in competition. John knew that his role faithfully was to prepare the way for he that was coming after. And it is our work, brothers and sisters, to prepare a generation to increase with Christ while we decrease. We're not, God has not put us on the battlefield to hold a position. No, he has put us here, as it were, to lend our backs and our shoulders for those to step on them and to go higher than we have gone. This is what Elijah is to do, but this is not the spirit we see. Why? Because we are refusing to fall on the rock and be broken. We're refusing to humble ourselves. And too often, brothers and sisters, the innocent, the innocent uh, uh, believers, those who are watching and those who are uh, 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 endeavoring to follow God, they see this competition. They see this bickering going back and forth. They see these big eyes. They see all these chiefs and they see no Indians. They see everybody trying to put themselves out. They don't see anybody being helped and encouraged. They don't see anyone being, being, being motivated to work for God. They don't see it. They see competition. They see strife. And sometimes they stand back and they don't know what to do because they see bullets flying back and forth. But oh, brothers and sisters, God is going to God that's gathering of people. Why? Because they're in their closets and they're praying and they're pleading for the work of God. They want to be used or not used at all just so that God's work can go forth. This is what Elijah, this is what God is pulling his people to the forefront to be. But God is allowing all this happenings in the world. God is allowing all this confusion. Don't you believe brothers and sisters that God is dead? God is letting this come because he's letting character 
be developed. He's letting people choose sides, whose side you are on. As God says, Moses says, who's on the Lord's side? Come on to me. Notice you're back in Daniel 11, Daniel chapter 11, verse 40, the Bible says, and at that time, the king at the time of the end, the king of the south shall push at him and the king of the, so the king of the south is speaking of France. Again, pastor, where you get France from? We're going to get to that when you look in the book of Daniel, but right here, right France, 1798, you're taking notes. And then I want you to write Revelation chapter 11. Just put this in your notes, put it in your notes. We're coming back to it. All right. Revelation chapter 11. <clears throat> and I want you to write uh, Revelation 11. I want you to write verse one. Hmm. Verse one to 14. Um, verse one to 14. Revelation chapter 11. Now, Revelation chapter 11, I don't, I'm not, I'm not going to give you all that. We're, just put it down. France. <clears throat> You're going to put France next to the first king of the south in verse 40. Because we said the king of the south was symbolized by Egypt. They would occupy Egypt in a literal sense. But after the cross, they would occupy Egypt or they would be represented by Egypt in a spiritual sense by taking on the spirit and the teachings and the attributes of Egypt. Just like in the book of Revelation, Babylon is not literal Babylon, but it is spiritual Babylon, the mother of harlots, right? So in 1798, the king of the south pushes at the king of the north. And we said that was when, um, Berthier, the king of France, came against the papacy. Uh, in 1798, the Pope was taken captive and was taken back to France of where he later died. And in 1798, as the beast was going into captivity, we showed you there was another power that would be rising, right? All right, hold your marker. We're going to Revelation 13. Going to Revelation chapter 13, Revelation, the 13th chapter. Notice what it says. Revelation chapter 13. Look at verse 11. Look at verse 10. Pardon me. Well, yeah, verse 10. Revelation chapter 13, verse 10. I want you to see this, brothers and sisters. I want you to see this. So right there next to verse 40, that first phrase, and the king of the south shall push at him. And we saw that that pushing was just like the Medes and the Persians. They pushed to the west, to the east. Um, no, they pushed to the west, to the north and to the south. They came from the way of the east. And the Bible says none was able to stand before him. Right. And he did according to his will. So the king of the south comes, he pushes at the king of the north, the papacy. And the papacy cannot stand before him. It comes crashing down, right? And then it says, what is happening while the king of the north is falling off her pedestal? She's falling off her pedestal. Now let's see what's happening. Revelation chapter 13, and we're looking at verse 10. We're starting in verse 10. The Bible says, he that leadeth into captivity shall go into captivity. He that killeth with the sword must be killed with the sword. Here is the patience of the saints. Verse 11. And I beheld another beast coming up out of the earth. So while the papacy is going down, while she's being led into captivity by France, as it were, Napoleon, the Bible says, and I saw another beast rise up out of the earth, having two horns like a lamb, but he spake 
as a dragon. And we saw that this power was America. This power was America. Now let's go back in our Bibles to the book of Daniel now. Should have a marker there so you could just flip back and forth. Just flip back and forth. And the Bible says something here. All right, in verse 40. It says, And at the time of the end, the king of the south shall push at him. And the king of the north shall come against him like a whirlwind with chariots and with horsemen and with many ships. And he shall enter into the countries and shall overflow and pass over. So here the Bible says that this king of the north is going to come. Now I want you to go in your Bibles. Hold your finger there. Go to the book of Ezekiel. You're going to Ezekiel chapter 26, I believe it is. Ezekiel the 26th chapter. Ezekiel chapter 26. Ezekiel 26. All right. Ezekiel 26. And we're going to close here because this could have, should have been on Wednesday. But nonetheless, we, we're not going to cram it all down your throats, uh, being that you didn't have, we didn't have the two nights before. All right, so now the king of the north is actually making his way back, right? <clears throat> now, the Bible says this in verse 3 of Ezekiel 26, verse 3. It says, Therefore, thus saith the Lord God, Behold, I'm against thee, O Tyrus, and I will cause what? Many nations to come against thee, as, as the sea causeth his ways to come up. I'm in Ezekiel 26, verse 3. And then I'm jumping down to verse 7 now. It says, For thus saith the Lord God, Behold, I will bring upon Tyrus Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, a king of kings, from where? The north. With what? With horses, with chariots, and with horsemen, and companies, and much people. So the Bible is telling us that when the king of the north returns, the king of the north is not coming back by himself. Because remember, when, you, when we have studied the papacy, the papacy is a little horn that does not grow up on its own, but it actually rides upon other powers. She came to power because of King Clovis. She came to power because of her alliance with apostate Christianity. This is what brought her to power the first time. And this is what will bring her to power the second time. Now, before we, before we, as we're winding this down, we're making our final descent, as they would say on the plane, all laptops and computers and, and, and devices, if you would please put them away as we're about to make our final descent into whatever state we have. We want to thank you for flying with us and they give you all these things and they tell you, you know that you're just a few, few, uh, 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 a few miles out and you're about to land. All right. So if you have your laptops, put them away and put your tray table up and, and, and put your seatbelt on. We're about to make our final descent. Amen. Go to Revelation 17. Go to Revelation chapter 17. <clears throat> Revelation chapter 17, because I want you to notice something in Revelation 17. In Revelation 17, the Bible shows us this power, which is also the king of the north power. But again, we're going to come back to this in Revelation. Again, I don't want to overemphasize that. So she's going to come back. But where is she coming back from? Remember, she was taken down. Revelation 13 says she received a deadly wound. So Revelation 17, Revelation 13, she will receive a deadly wound. <clears throat> but, uh, uh, and Daniel chapter 11 says that the king of the south pushed at her. That was the king of the north, the papacy, Jezebel, uh, uh, Antichrist. That was the deadly wound. 1798, deadly wound, king of the south, France. And this is the environment in which the papacy is actually going to be nurtured so she can come back to power. 
Now, I want you to follow this point because Satan is a counterfeit to Christ. We read in Revelation chapter 12, verse 14, how God had a place prepared for his church as she flew into the wilderness and God nourished her for a time, times, and the dividing of times. But then the, the, the Jezebel, the papacy, the king of the north, sent a flood to try to destroy the church. And the Bible says that the earth opened her mouth and swallowed up the flood. The earth helped the woman. Who helped the woman? It was none other than America. America opened her shores, and that is where the church came out of the wilderness and went, almost like an Elijah per se. It came out of the wilderness, and it was able now to preach in the open air. So while she was coming out of the wilderness, God's church, Satan's church, because remember, God's people was in the captivity, now she goes into captivity. They were killed with the sword, she's wounded by a sword. And she goes into the wilderness, and while she's in the wilderness, Satan is going to nourish her. Look at what your screen says, right? <clears throat> so this is the wilderness. This is the deadly wound place. This is the, the place where the king of the north, as it were, falls into. It goes into the wilderness, right? And so in Revelation 17 is going to show us how she comes out of the wilderness to once again make war with God's people. And after she makes war with the people of God, she will eventually go into perdition. Look with me here in Revelation 17. Watch this, Revelation 17. Look at verse one, Revelation 17, look at verse one. All right, all right, so this is the king of the north. Remember, she's gonna come back with chariots, with whirlwinds. Uh, uh, she's, going to, she's gonna come back with, 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 with many people. But wait a minute, what do you mean many people? She's coming, she's not coming back by herself. She's not coming out of this wilderness barren. She's going to come out after having been nurtured by Satan, by the powers that brought her to power in the beginning, the modern day Clovis, the modern day apostate church, those who fall away from Bible truth are going to bring her back on the scene. And oh, brothers and sisters, they're doing it. They're bringing her back. She's, she's, she's already showing signs of life. They're already laying out the red carpet for her to come back on the scene. She, oh, she, oh, she's prepared to make a, a huge spectacle. She's, 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 she's just, hey, the, the trumpets are sounding. She's coming out of the wilderness. Even as we speak, brothers and sisters, even as we speak, Revelation 17. Look what it says in Revelation 17. It says, and there came and there came one of the seven angels, which had the seven vows. And he talked with me, saying unto me, come hither and I will show thee the judgment of the great whore that sitteth upon many waters. With whom the kings of the earth have committed fornication. And the inhabitants of the earth have been made drunk by the wine of her fornication. Verse three. So he carried me away in the spirit into the wilderness. And I saw a woman sit upon a scarlet colored beast, full of the names of blasphemy, having seven heads and ten horns. And the woman was arrayed in purple. She had scarlet color. She was decked with gold and precious stones and pearls, having a golden cup in her hand full of the abominations and filthiness of her fornication. Verse five. And upon her head, upon her forehead was a name written, Mystery Babylon, the great, the mother of harlots and the abomin and abominations of the earth. And I started in verse one, verse six. And I saw a woman and I saw the woman, this mystery, this woman, this Babylon, and I saw the woman drunken with the blood of the saints 
and with the blood of the mothers of Jesus. And, I, and when I saw her, I wondered, I wondered with great admiration. And the angel said unto her, Wherefore didst thou marvel? I will tell thee the mystery of the woman and of the beast that carrieth her, which have seven heads and ten horns. Now watch this, verse 8, verse 8. The beast that thou sawest was, watch this, it was 538 to 1798. Write that down. This beast was 538 to 1798. Write that down. And is not. 1798 to the present, right? She's coming to be, and we're going to talk more about that, but just for the for sake of clarification, 1798 to present, she is not. She does not have the power she once wielded in 538 to 1798. So the beast that was, 538, 1798, is not 1798 to the present. All right? The beast that was and is not. Now watch this. Now next to the beast, you want to put parentheses if you're taking notes and write king of the north. You can write Jezebel. You can write the little horn. You can write the Antichrist power, 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, verses 1 to 8. So these are all the names for this beast, all right? The beast, king of the north, you can write Jezebel, little horn of Daniel 7, uh, Antichrist power of 2 Thessalonians, you can write papacy, it's all the same power, brothers and sisters. This, this, this harlotry here, all the same power, okay? So when we say was, we're talking about 538, 1798, King of the North. We're talking about is not wilderness. That's where she is in this verse here in verse seven, in chapter 17. She is not. Now watch what it goes on to say. The beast that thou sawest was and is not. Now watch this. And shall ascend out of the bottomless pit. What is shall ascend? Past, present, or future? Future. Future. So the beast that was, you know the times. She is not, you know the times. And she shall. Future. This beast is coming back. So when it comes back, Daniel 11, verse 40, the king of the north will come against him. Are you with me? So the the beast that was, and since we're studying Daniel 11, let's call it the king of the north. The king of the north that was, the king of the north that is not, and the king of the north that shall be. Shall be is when it comes back. Verse 40. It's pushing back. It's coming back. His deadly wound is healed. All the world is Wandering after the beast. I pray that you got it. I pray that you have that in your notes. You just write it down, meditate it, go over it a few times. All right. <clears throat> Next time we come together, I'll have it on the chart and you'll be able to see it. But you should write it down. Short pen, short pencil, better than a long memory. Write these things down, brothers and sisters. And say, man, it's so much information. I know it so much. When you got your degree, it was so much information. But you said, praise God, you got it, right? Because you would get that job. Don't be despaired when you have all this. No, just put it on your paper. Pray, God will give you clarity. God will give you clarity. Don't, don't, don't falter. Don't let your mind lock up. Study the word of God, uh, Paul says, to show thyself approved unto God. A work, man, you got to work at this, brothers and sisters. You got to work. These things don't come easy, brothers and sisters. They don't come easy. The more you study, the more God will reveal to you. The more God will reveal. Notice. So now, 
is coming back. Daniel 11:40. she's coming back. So she was, she is not, but she is coming back. We know she's coming back. So as we know she's coming back, what should we be doing? Not just telling the world she's coming back. There's, we have to be visiting the fatherless. We have to be visiting the widows. We have to make sure that we're keeping ourselves unspotted from the world. I'm going to give you one last text in Revelation 14. One last text in Revelation 14. Remember, it says that this, she's the mother of harlots. You're only a mother if you have children. You need children. Jezebel had children. Athaliah was her daughter. Herodias had a daughter. Je this, this papacy, this king of the north, this antichrist has daughters. She has daughters. This church has daughters. But watch what the Bible says in Revelation 14. Revelation 14, going to be key when we go back to Daniel chapter 11, the next time we come together. It says, and I looked, and lo, a lamb stood on Mount Zion, and with him 144,000, having the Father's name written in their foreheads. <clears throat> and I heard the voice of heaven, and the voice of many waters jump down, verse 3, and they sung the 144, sung a new song before the throne. Jump down, verse four, these, these are they which were not what? Defiled. By what? Women, plural. Wonder who these women are. Well, in the context of Revelation, the mother of harlots and her daughters. While the world is drinking from this cup of fornication and becoming drunk, she's not. She's not. These here on Mount Zion, they're not drunk. They're not drunk. They're not perverting judgment. They're not drinking from that cup. They have the cup of salvation, not the cup of fornication. They have the cup of salvation. And this is the cup that you and I have to drink from, brothers and sisters. Because now, when we come back to Daniel chapter 11, not tonight, but when we come back to Daniel chapter 11, and we look at how the king of the north arises and the powers that is causing her to come back and, and, and bring with her many companies, you are going to see when you look around, you're going to say, wow, I see her. There she is. Man, she's coming. She's here. She's here. But why? But why is she not doing what she did? Because God still has his hand and God is still trying to get you ready. Oh, yes, <clears throat> she's clearing her throat. She's, she's, she's being clothed with her vesters so she can come forth and do as she's done. But while she's doing that, brothers and sisters, God is trying to place his seal in that forehead. God is trying to get you ready so that when God, when the angel steps away, then you will be able to stand. Heavenly Father, Lord, we pray, we pray, that we can reflect the lovely image of Jesus. Father, we pray that we can draw closer to your precious bleeding side. Lord, we want to be able to say, I am thine, O Lord, and I have heard your voice, and it told your love to me. This is what we want to be able to say. Father, we can sing it but we can even sing it from a divided heart. We can sing it from a sin polluted heart. We could sing it because we know it. But Father, we want this to be our testimony. Draw near to us and draw us nearer to thee. Lord, we take our heels out of the sand. We're not, we don't want to pull away the shoulder. Lord, we want to come unto thee. Be with us. Keep us, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen.